First of all, I will introduce myself. I'm Dr. Spiridon Juliaras. I'm a obstetrician gynecologist and uh, IVF specialist. Uh, and I'm working in a specialized women and children hospital, Sidra Medicine Hospital here in Doha, Qatar. I'm also an assistant professor of obstetrics in Wales Cornell Medical College. And I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak about a subject I'm quite passionate about, which is personalization in reproductive medicine. Uh, this is my disclaimer. And uh, my objectives today is to argue the case for personalization in uh, reproductive medicine. And I will try to describe each of the main steps of the uh, IVF journey uh, that, can be, that can be personalized and present the latest evidence to you. First, I will start with this picture of uh, these uh, sculptures, starting from an egg and a sperm, all the way to an, uh, a fetus. Uh, this is my view from my office every day, this beautiful art installation by the British artist Damien Hirst. Uh, it's just outside our uh, hospital. And then I want to take you back in time and show you some other pictures from another uh, miraculous journey. Uh, when Louis Brown, the first IVF baby, was born in Oldham Hospital in the northwest of England. Uh, so these two pioneers, uh, Patrick Steptoe, Bob Edwards, uh, back at the time, tried 467 times to get one live birth. So the success rate of IVF at the time was 0.2% per cycle started which is quite low. But of course we have come a long way and with different technologies, success rates in IVF have improved significantly. Still, in the last few years, we see a plateau in the uh, success rates, which uh, even in the better prognosis patient, in the younger patients, still don't exceed 40 to 45%. So IVF is an unsuccessful treatment. And uh, I think personalized or precision medicine is the answer to increasing even further the success rate. Uh, precision medicine is trying to integrate environmental, lifestyle, and genetic information to improve and personalize healthcare and takes into account the individual differences between the patients. However, in reproductive medicine, it's still in its early days because the treatment is not personalized to one person by in three, the mom, the dad, and the uh, fetus, the embryo. Uh, and there are many different uh, factors that can influence success and different biological systems are involved. Uh, but precision medicine can help optimize outcomes in IVF, uh, improve live birth rates, shorten the interval to pregnancy, reduce or even eliminate the, uh, the significant complication of IVF, which is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and eventually have healthy mothers and children uh, at uh, a reduced financial and emotional burden. And there are opportunities for uh, personalizing the treatment throughout the, the IVF, uh, the patient's journey, which I'm gonna try and summarize for you. So starting with the eggs, uh, controlled ovarian stimulation, uh, we try to individualize the protocols to stimulate the ovaries. There are many different protocols, different ways of suppressing the pituitary. Uh, we have biomarkers to select the best dosing uh, for the gonadotrophins. We can give conventional stimulation or less intense stimulation, mild stimulation. We have different choices of trigger. Uh, but here I have present one uh, big study which suggests that uh, individualizing the uh, dosing based on ovarian reserve testing does not really improve live birth rates or reduce the costs. And there are many attempts to try and decide. Uh, there have been many attempts, many, many studies trying to decide which protocols work better for which patients. However, uh, you can see uh, more than 60 different meta-analyses comparing different approaches 
to IVF. Uh, and I present only one meta-analysis here by Santi, uh, published in 2017, uh, uh, and they managed to consider all different combinations. There are some useful conclusions that I'm not going to go into detail. However, there is large heterogeneity in the study, and the truth of the matter is we still don't know what's the best way to stimulate our patients. And there are many attempts, there are companies, there is a company who developed uh, a personalized algorithm based on anti mullerian hormone and body weight, uh, and they market uh, a gonadotrophin called Recovel. Uh, but AMH is not a perfect test. There is a disc uh, discrepancy between AMH and AFC. And uh, there is even variability of AMH intracycle and intracycle in the same patient. Even the adjustment of the dose uh, and fine tuning is an area of significant research. And perhaps one of the reasons that all these studies are so inconsistent and patients react differently to different medication could be uh, pharmacogenomics. So pharmacogenomics is a science which investigates uh, the different uh, response of women according to their genes. Uh, and there are many receptor polymorphisms that have been studied for the FSH receptor. And some of those SNPs uh, are clearly associated with uh, a difference in the ovarian response. I'm not going to go into detail into that as well. And furthermore, we talk about pharmacoepigenomics. It's the science that uh, deals with the influence that the epigenetic alterations have on the drug efficiency and safety. Uh, one of the most common epigenetic mechanisms is methylation, one of the best studied. To go one step further, the epigenetic status can also be modified by microRNAs. And it seems that perhaps in the future, a combined analysis of genetic variations and epigenetic modifications could help us to find the optimal stimulation pathways for our patients. Now, after uh, talking about the eggs, I'll talk a little bit about the sperm. Male infertility is not as well studied as female infertility. Uh, and uh, investigating male infertility by using genomics and proteomics may offer new insights into the management of the infertile couple. And there is potential for targeted diagnostic and therapeutic advances, even development of new drugs. One of the areas of interest is identifying and treating oxidative stress, which was mentioned in, by one of my our speakers earlier in the day. Uh, there are several tests which can uh, identify sperm DNA integrity, uh, S CSA, SCD, Tunnel, and Comet. Uh, but Tunnel and Comet seem to be the ones that have better predictive capacity. However, all these tests uh, are still debated, and there is no consistent relationship between sperm DNA abnormalities and pregnancy outcomes. There are also advanced sperm selection techniques rather than an embryologist simply choosing one sperm to inject when we do ICSI. There are different techniques to select the best one. Um, however, even one of the most promising ones, which uh, was the hyaluronic acid binding assay or PIXI, uh, has not been proven to improve uh, live birth in a large randomized control trial. However, there was decrease in miscarriage rate, and uh, there, are, there is a lot more focus now in sperm selection uh, and male infertility is uh, really now the focus uh, as it should be. After the egg and the sperm, we have different strategies to personalize the embryo transfer. We have uh, ways, we can freeze the embryos, we have to decide uh, how many embryos we should transfer to our patients. And we have uh, very elaborate ways of trying to select good embryos, time-lapse imaging, and pre-implantation genetic testing. Pre-implantation genetic testing has evolved 
a lot. Uh, many of you might know it as uh, PGD. Uh, now this is the new nomenclature, the new name. And over the years, we started with RSCGH, then next generation sequencing, but the future seems to be non-invasive pre-implantation genetic testing. This is commercially available uh, and has uh, at the moment good efficacy. Uh, uh, they, they examine the spent culture media rather than biopsying the embryo and using customized algorithms, we can select the best embryo. And this seems to be the future. And after we have selected a good embryo, we need to optimize the environment, personalize endometrial receptivity. Uh, it has long been recognized that controlled ovarian hyperstimulation may affect endometrial gene expression profiles. And uh, supraphysiological levels of hormones during controlled ovarian stimulation are associated with modifications to the endometrium. Uh, including greater endometrial advancement and altered gene expression. Uh, there are many tests that uh, usually uh, transcriptomics are involved. Uh, that there are many tests to assess endometrial receptivity. The most known ones are the ERA test and the WIN test. Uh, the ERA test, this is a landmark publication by Carlos Simon Group. Uh, is the most widely used. After a dummy cycle and the biopsy, uh, the implantation window is specified and the appropriate number of days of progesterone supplementation is determined. And uh, you can get a report of whether the window of implantation is displaced or not. As you would expect, uh, there are many studies looking at uh, whether this is really effective and they are conflicting. So it seems that for the general population, uh, ERA test does not improve uh, outcomes, but for a specific group of people with recurrent implantation failure, it may have, uh, it may have a space. There are also other tests focusing again on the environment, on the endometrium. Uh, are, some tests are uh, looking at uh, endometrial microbiome or even assessing for chronic endometritis. And even furthermore, uh, microRNAs, which I mentioned before, are also, uh, which are small molecules that regulate gene expression. MicroRNAs are studied more and more, and they have been uh, associated uh, with human embryo implantation. And there is also a commercially available test called MIRA, uh, which is uh, uh, mitochondrial RNA based endometrial receptivity analysis. And after we have an appropriate embryo in a good environment, we need to optimize and personalize the luteal support. We can decide whether we will, uh, and we can decide the luteal support, depending on whether it's a fresh or frozen cycle, the kind of trigger we have given. Uh, but we also now monitor progesterone levels, especially in frozen cycles. Uh, and it seems luteal support is not also a one size fit all scenario. Finally, um, we need to personalize uh, the uh, counseling we do for our patients, and maybe this slide should have been in the beginning. We know a lot about the significance of subfertility in the emotional health of our patients, uh, and giving them correct counseling and personalized success rates may help them have realistic expectations. And there are many different tools now to uh, help our patients get an accurate idea of their success rates. Like uh, I have here the OPIS calculator developed by the University of Aberdeen. So there are many steps that uh, can be personalized in the IVF journey and I, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are more and more used in uh, IVF. It's a hot topic studied a lot and it seems that accumulating all this data and using uh, these technologies 
uh, will help us better optimize outcomes in the future. So as you can see in this statement, a combination of ART data simulation and machine learning will lead to hyper-personalized treatment approach and maximize the productive outcomes. This seems to be the future. And uh, very recently, I had the chance to attend the first Artificial Intelligence and Fertility World Conference, which was hosted in Dubrovnik. So for future advances, uh, these are some of my thoughts. Uh, research into personalized nutrition, uh, effect on urogenital microbiome, uh, non-invasive endometrial receptivity tests, uh, there's a focus on that as well, uh, testing for endometrial receptivity without doing biopsies, pharmacoepigenomics, as I mentioned, new biomarkers like human seminal plasma proteome, uh, screening for monogenic diseases and gene editing, CRISPR technology, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, and also multi-gene panel testing to identify the risk for reproductive health disorders and to direct controlled ovarian stimulation. So to conclude, pharmacogenomics and pharmacoepigenomics are still in early stages. These are some of my thoughts, but there is future and this is how we will best optimize uh, the drug therapy. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning will be increasingly used in IVF. Um, Reproductomics is a terminology we will hear more and more. It's about the impact of omics, omic technologies on human reproduction. And new research and innovation will pave the way towards a hyper-personalized approach to treatment. And have no doubt, personalization in IVF is here to stay. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is a picture of our beautiful hospital. And as you know, in a few days, World Cup, you may or may not know, I'm not a football fan, but World Cup is starting in Qatar in a few days. If any of you is visiting, please uh, get in touch. This is my email and uh, it would be nice if you come and visit us. Uh, so please connect. Thank you.